Garth Richard. We'll look forward to your talk. So, take it away. <laughs> Right, so welcome to the, uh, the first session of the day, hopefully. And uh, this is not your mother's TDD, so uh, type-driven development in TypeScript. So we've got a lot of material to get through and uh, very little time to do it, so we'll just abbreviate the introductions. So uh, my name's Garth Gilmore, and I'm the head of learning at Instill. And my name's Richard Gibson, and I work uh, mainly on DevTools and AWS at Hexlabs. So, uh, as you know, there are many languages these days that transpile to JavaScript, and you've got a very, very broad choice there. So, uh, you've got Reason ML, uh, you've got PureScript, you've got Elm, all that kind of thing. But far and away, the leading contender at the moment is TypeScript. And uh, the way TypeScript is introduced, of course, is that it's an extension to JavaScript, and uh, it brings the world of strong typing to JavaScript. So, uh, you've got the addition of generics, you've got interfaces, you can give variables types, you know, all that that kind of thing. So uh, everybody's familiar with TypeScript from that light. But after that, things get very, very weird, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So TypeScript is a structural language. It doesn't do nominal typing, it does structural typing. What does that actually mean? Well, in nominal typing, let's say you've got a type called employee and a type called member of staff. Well, those are two completely different types, even if they have precisely the same structure, you know, even if they have the same fields and methods and so on. Uh, but in structural typing, uh, they actually count as the same type because they have the, uh, the same internal structure. So structural typing is where two types are identical, even if they have the same structure. And of course, you may have heard this before. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you have with duct typing in uh, Ruby and Python. But here we're talking about these checks, these structural checks being enforced at build time, uh, not at runtime. So here's a little example of structural typing here. So uh, we've got three types. We've got a type called pair, we've got a type called tuple2, and we've got a type called dyad. And if you look at them, uh, you'll see that they all have the same shape, okay? So in nominal typing, these would be three completely different types. Yeah, in structural typing, they're all pretty much the same because they all have the same internal structure. And then you see here we can declare some test methods. So we've got a test method that takes a pair, we've got a test method that takes a tuple, we've got a test method that takes a dyad. Yeah. But if I go out and try and call them, well, you see here I'm passing in an object literal and I'm passing in a dyad object. But I can call test1, which is declared to take a pair, and it works. I can call test2, which is declared to take a tuple2, and it works. I can call test3, which is declared to take a dyad, and it works. You know, So uh, all of these calls will succeed, whether we're passing in a dyad object or an object literal or whatever, uh, because they have the same structure. Okay, So uh, whenever we run it, uh, it works just fine. Okay, So that gives you a little bit of an insight into what structural typing is. But we're only getting started. Okay, you, You'll find that we're going to say that an awful lot in this talk, you know. So this is uh, only the beginning. There's lots of goodness layered on top of that, which uh, Richard will now take us to uh, to level two. Okay. So for next level, we're just going to talk about a few of the basic tools. Oh, thanks, Garth. Um, that TypeScript gives us when we're working with structured types. So we'll start with some stuff to do with type aliases, uh, then talk about some union types, intersection types, and then literal types. So type aliases. So if you think about when you're using a constant in value programming or runtime programming to, because you want to not repeat something, uh, repeat some sort of value, uh, well, the same idea can be made with types as well. And this is something that's in a number of languages. So instead of having to write the same type signature in numerous different places, we can actually assign this to an alias and then use that throughout our code just, to, for, uh, just in, so it means that we're only having to update in one place. So as you can see in this example, we've got a type alias, my callback, and that's a, a, for a function that will take a string number and boolean and then return a map of string and booleans. Then we have another type alias, my data, which is just um, a tuple type or a list that can a, a list, but it's a specific type of list that can only take three values: a string, a number, and a boolean in that order. And so you can see here where we've got a function uh, of sample. We don't have to go and write the full callback signature here. We're able to just use our my callback type alias, use our my, uh, our my data type alias as well as the parameters. And then what we can do with that 
Um, so you can see these are the type aliases. What you can do with that my data there that we've sent in that tuples of three, we can use a spread operator, and that will be used as the parameters for the function. And so what happens here is that if we were to my data was say a string, a string, and a boolean, uh, well the compiler would catch this and wouldn't let this uh, wouldn't let that pass. So you see where we're uh, there an example here where we are going and creating our my data. And we've got, a uh, again, the compiler's enforcing that it's a string followed by a number followed by a boolean. And that we're able to then uh, make a function that takes those three parameters and creates a map. And as you can see, whenever we, um, when we, we do this, the compiler ensures all the correctness. And when we run it, it runs as, as planned. So, OK, so next, union types. So union types are where we want to take specific, uh, just separate types that are unrelated and be able to make a new type that can be any of those separate types. So for the exa in this example, we've got one called a return value, which could be a string or this type point that we've created or say a DOM element. So, um, and then when we go to use this, we can use it and we've got here a function that will return one of these types. So what we're doing is we're taking a number, and based on what that number is, we will return a different type here. So if the number is less than 50, we're going to return a string. If it's less than 100, we're going to return a DOM element. Otherwise, we're returning our type, that point, uh, the point type that we created. And here we go. Here's where we're seeing. OK, and then whenever we actually go to use this, we can see that if we can actually uh, use our instance of a keyword uh, to check what the element is, to see what type that, uh, that instance is. And when we do this, um, TypeScript is able to say that if we have a DOM element, it's actually able to access those methods without having to explicitly cast. So it's like a smart cast that's able to be used. So it, the compiler is doing a lot of work for you to, to, catch, uh, to catch those sort of uh, to ensure that you've got the correct types in the correct places and that the right methods are available or functions are available on those. So intersection types. This is where we're able to join two existing types together to make a new one. So if you know anything about your Battlestar Galactica, you'll know a Cylon is both an individual and a machine. So it means that it has all the functionality of an individual and of a machine. And you can see that when we use this ampersand, we combine the two together to make our new type. Now, if we're going to go and actually instantiate one of those types, that cyclon, you can see that we have all of the, uh, the, pro the functions that were declared as a machine and an individual. So it must have the charge, feel, think, and work. Also, though, now a cylon can be used anywhere where, we, where uh, a machine is, is expected or where an individual is expected. So if you have a parameter that takes an individual, this boomer can be used at that place. OK, type literals. I guess the easiest way to say what a type literal is is to say that it is literally only one. It can only be assigned to one value. So for example, with first one here, we've got a type that's Homer. That's a string literal, which means that the type, we, so we have done nothing here at runtime here. But what we've done is we've created a type that can only be this string, Homer. It sounds a bit strange. Why would you actually want to use this? But if we, we can use this with other things. So if you can see here, we're combining it with our union types. And when we do this, we can create a type called Simpsons, which can be Homer, Marge, Bart, Sim uh, Lisa, or Maggie, or the Flintstones. We can do this with Booleans as well, which I haven't got here. But, uh, or we can do it with, with numbers. So if we want to just create a closed set of numbers, say our even digits, or uh, even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, or, or our odd numbers, then we can, com we can combine again. So. Where would we use these? So say we're using this, and we've got, now we've got two demo functions uh, where they're taking, uh, one takes Simpsons or an even number as the inputs, and one takes the Flintstones or the odds. So what, what can we do with this? Well, if we go to run these, we can see that if we use demo one with Homer or uh, with an even number, we'll see that the compiler allows this to happen, or demo two with Wilma or an odd number, that that also was allowed. But these are fine, but whenever we try to run um, demo one with a Flintstone or with an odd number, we can't do this. We'll get red lines. The compiler won't allow this to pass. And again, demo two with, it, with Homer will do the same. Back to you, Garth. 
Cool. So uh, this may seem like an awful lot to take in if you're meeting TypeScript for the first time, but believe it or not, that was just the warm-up. You know, so we're now on to uh, level three. You know, we're now on to the uh, the main event, and this is something called mapped types. So uh, regular programming for the moment, we're going to call programming in the world of values. You know, so we normally program with you know uh, numbers and objects and so on, but now we're going to be doing programming with types. But in the world of values, of course, we're well used to the map operation. So you could could uh, map over a list of employees to extract their salaries or to extract their salaries and their department, something like that. So we're well used to the idea of mapping over lists of objects at runtime. What we're not used to is mapping over types at compile time, but that's what uh, TypeScript lets us do. So a map type is when we have an existing type and then we're going to map over, we're going to loop over the properties of that type in order to define a new one. So to see why this is useful, if you think about you know, the canonical web application where you have the front end and the browser and then a SQL database, and uh, you're inevitably pushed towards having three versions of each type. Um, so let's say we have a, a customer type, and whenever we're receiving the request over the web, well, uh, the credit card number is just going to be a string. But then in our canonical customer representation, you know, in our business logic, we're going to have a credit card type. And then whenever we go to push it to the database, well, it's a string again, but now we want it to be a var char. So we want three versions, maybe, of the customer type. Uh, only one uh, in which the credit card is uh, strongly typed, and the others it's going to be either a string or a var char. So wouldn't it be nice if we could generate two versions of the type from the canonical one, the one that's in our business logic? So that's what map types give us. So the syntax takes a while to get used to here, but if you look, you see we've got a type called instill read only, and what we're doing is we're mapping over the properties of T. Okay, so whatever T is, we're going to map over its properties, and we're going to generate a new type. And that new type will be the same as the existing one, except if you look there, we're adding the read only keyword. So everything's going to be uh, read only. Or we could make it mutable, yeah? So we could loop over the properties of T, and we could say minus read only. So what that actually means is take it away if it's there. Or we could loop over all the properties of T, and we could make it partial by adding the question mark. Or uh, we could go through and uh, we could say everything's required. So whenever we say minus question mark, we're saying uh, if the uh, optionality is there, uh, remove it. So this is the idea of mapped types, the idea that you can have an existing type, call it T, and then iterate over all the properties and add or remove things to create a new type. And here's some demos of using it here. So in every case, we're going to have a person object, yeah, but the reference to it is going to be either a constant person or a mutable person using the types that we've just created. Yeah? And uh, if the reference is a constant person, then we won't be allowed to change the thing. Whereas if the reference is mutable, uh, then we will. And then uh, same thing here, where uh, let's say we've got a customer type and we create an instill partial of customer. Well, uh, if a person is a partial customer, you know, if it's a subset of a customer, uh, then we'll be able to do that right there uh, and so on. So you can see uh, how we can use uh, map types to generate one type from another. But if you think about it, you start getting into problems because properties include both fields and methods. So let's say we define a stringify uh, type. So this is going to be a map type where the new type is going to be the same as whatever T was, but everything's going to be of type string. But unfortunately, uh, that includes both fields and methods. Yeah. So what we want to do is we want to say, no, 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 no. It's only the fields should be strings yeah, and leave the methods alone. So uh, map types can actually include conditionality, and that's what we're doing here. So you see here we're saying, okay, uh, if the type uh, of the current property extends function, we'll then leave it alone, or rather replace it with itself, okay? So uh, effectively, th there'll be no change. So functions will be left alone, whereas fields will have their types changed to string. So if we use our stringify version, uh, we can see that it kind of works, yeah, but whenever it comes to what was a method, we can assign it to a string, whoops, you know, whereas uh, if we use our stringify fields type, well, then it works just fine. Okay, so uh, this is a, a good example of why we need to have the ability to do conditionals uh, whenever we're working with map types. 
But that's just the beginning, <laughs> okay? So uh, we can take all of this as a foundation, yeah, and then start doing really interesting things. We can start doing what some people would call type-driven development, other people would call type-level programming. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're programming in the compile space. We're programming with types, yeah? So here's a, a nice little example here. So uh, let me just see. Yeah. So uh, let's say what we want to do is we want to have a convert function. And the idea is that if you call it and pass in centimeters, then what you get back is inches. And if you call it and pass in inches, then what you get back is centimeters. And this is all worked out at compile time. In other words, if I pass in a, a value in terms of centimeters, when the, the result should be strongly typed as inches. So I should be able to call in yards safely, and that should be determined at compile time. Whereas if I pass in inches, then the result should come back in centimeters, and on that I should be able to call in meters. Again, this should all be worked out safely uh, at compile time. So how are we going to do this? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, as Richard was showing us, we can use our union types. So we can define a type called centimeters or inches, and this is either centimeters or inches. Yeah. And then uh, we can define what we've called a toggle type. So uh, a good way to understand this is that we're going to pass in uh, a t, and we're going to get back the reverse of t. <laughs> okay. So uh, if t is inches, then centimeters or inches toggle will be centimeters, yeah, and uh, vice versa. And here's our little um, implementation here. So uh, the thing to note is that we've got a guard. Yeah? So we're checking there to see if the input is of type centimeters. Uh, so if it is, then the compiler has complete metaphysical certitude uh, that input is centimeters. So uh, our toggle type, uh, that's going to resolve to be inches yeah? and uh, vice versa. So uh, if we pass in inches, we'll get a strongly typed result of centimeters. If we pass in centimeters, we'll get back a strongly typed result of uh, inches yeah and that's really really nice you know so that's something that has value yeah and uh, we've managed to add that into our type system on the fly <laughs> Um, but that is slightly artificial because what we could have done is we could have achieved that with overloading. So, you know, in the interest of simplicity and demoing the feature, it's a little bit simple, you know, so we could uh, achieve the same effect with overloading. So let me just show you a really practical example. So we're all familiar, of course, with programming in the browser and document create element. So, for example, if we were to say document create element, and ask for a paragraph or a video element or something like that, uh, we would get back a node. But let's say if we were to say document create element and, and say P, well then we'd like something that we could set the, uh, the inner text of. If we were to say document create element video, well then we'd like something that we could set the, uh, the source of and so on. So here's how we could do it here. So what we're basically doing at the top there is we're creating a little map. So we're associating the string name of an HTML tag with the corresponding DOM node. And then below, we've got a type called result element of T. So what this is going to do is effectively it's going to do a lookup in that table. So T, we've said there extends string. So T is going to be some kind of string. And we're saying there in the bottom line, okay, if that string is a key in the table, we'll then return the corresponding HTML node type. In other words, uh, if T is label, well, then we'd like an HTML label element, please. You know, that's what we'd want the, uh, the result element of T to resolve as. And if there's nothing in the table to match against it, well, then a good old HTML element, uh, that'll do fine. So what we can do here is uh, we can have this little helper function, uh, create element with ID, which uses our uh, result element type. And uh, it's going to return a strongly typed result for us. So if I go on to the demo here, you see I can uh, call my function and say uh, I want a paragraph, or I want a label, or I want a canvas. And uh, the results that come back will be strongly typed. Okay? So I will be able to set properties specific to that particular node type. And again, none of this is happening at runtime. Uh, this is all happening at compile time. So uh, the, uh, the compiler is helping us. You know, it's guiding us to the correct solution. So this is a, a practical example of doing type level development. Um, and it just gets better from there. Yeah. So uh, we can go along yeah, and we can actually work out the types of the parameters at runtime. So here's a, a type that will resolve to all the parameters, then the first parameter, then the remaining parameters. And I know you kind of look at this and you go, what? Okay. So uh, l let me just uh, try and break it down a little bit more. So let's say we've got a demo function, and uh, this takes three inputs. And then we've got three variables here, uh, var1, 
var 2 and var 3. Okay? So you see there, we can only set var 1 to a tuple of all the parameters that the function takes. We can only set var 2 to a value of the same type as the first parameter that the function takes. And we can only set var 3 yeah, to be a tuple of the remaining parameters that the, uh, the function takes. Okay? Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's quite impressive. Yeah. And then uh, we have the implementation here, which is, uh, sorry, it's a little bit uh, tricky to talk through in the sunlight here, uh, but we can extract all the parameters, we can extract the first parameter, and we can extract the, uh, the remaining parameters. So uh, you might say that's a nice trick, yeah, but how would it actually be applied? So um, uh, whenever I was learning this myself, I kind of gave myself a graduation exercise, which was trying to implement partial invocation. So uh, in case you're not familiar, just let me quickly summarize what partial invocation is. So here we've just got a standard JavaScript function where we're going to take a regular expression and we're going to take some text. And we're going to find all the matches for the regular expression in the text text, and we're going to try to add them to uh, an output array. So we'll pass in an array, all the matches we find will be pushed onto that array, and then it's that array that's returned. So let's say we've got a regular expression, and uh, we've got two strings that we want to search. You know, so uh, this is how we could use it here, and uh, that would work just fine. But if you look, uh, we're duplicating the, uh, the regular expression. So what we could do with partial invocation is we could say, okay, I wish to partially apply find all matches. And the way I've written it is that we'll get back a function that takes a single input, and then if you call that, that will return a function that takes the remaining inputs, and then that's the thing we're actually going to call. So you see here, find three uppercase is going to be a function uh, that takes some text to be uh, searched and uh, an array that we want the results pushed into. So it's taking all the parameters after the, uh, the first original parameter. So that's what I tried to do. So uh, I thought this would be a, a really good demonstration of the types that we've just looked at. So uh, you see here we've got a, uh, a type called partially invoke using a type called any func, which just represents uh, any possible function. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, so uh, whenever we try and call this, it's going to return instead a function that takes the first parameter, and that's going to return a function uh, that takes the remaining parameters uh, using the types that we've just discussed, okay? So uh, I gave that a go, and what I didn't realize, or I hadn't thought about, was that other params there, it's actually going to return the, uh, the remaining parameters in a tuple. So I needed some way to uh, erase the tuple. So here's a, a standard JavaScript solution uh, using the types developed on the previous slide, and it doesn't quite work, okay? So uh, if I actually try it out with this example code here, uh, it comes close, yeah? But if you look, the, uh, the remaining parameters uh, need to get put inside a tuple. And uh, I played with that for close to a day, thinking, oh, maybe I can use the spread operator, or there must be some way of uh, uh, removing these parameters, but it turns out that can't be done, yeah? So so, uh, you know, in TypeScript at the minute, there doesn't seem to be a way to do that. And uh, that made me slightly unhappy. Yeah? So I uh, uh, went out into the garden and thumped a tree for a while and then came back and uh, had a good night's sleep and had to think about it and uh, then came up with uh, a solution. Yeah. So um, here's the, the same solution as before, except now you see we're using this uh, remainer type here. So uh, we've got this type called uh, remainer, and this is how it's implemented. And that, of course, is completely obvious, and we can just sum up now. No, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so this is a little bit weird. Okay. So what we're doing here is that uh, we're using our conditional types, but also we're using the infer keyword. So we're saying to TypeScript, please infer for me A. That's the type of all the the arguments, and please infer for me R, uh, that's the return type. And then what we're saying is, okay, if the type of all the arguments can be considered as a tuple of two types, well, please infer those two types, but all I want back is the signature of a function that takes the second type and the return value. Or if that's not the case, yeah, so if the arguments can be considered as a tuple of three types, you know, call it P1, P2, and P3, and by the way, infer those for me, well then, I want you to disregard P1 and return a function declaration which takes a P2 and a P3 and returns an R. 
Or if that's not the case, and uh, the arguments can be considered as a tuple of four types, well, then you get the idea, you know? So uh, we can go out and extend this as necessary, yeah? Or potentially, yeah, uh, we could do it using recursion. But uh, at that point, that's where my brain blows up, yeah? So uh, Richard will talk about that in a second, yeah? But the good news is I was able to go back to my original demo and uh, get this working just fine. So uh, that made me a very, very happy camper. So I, I retired from the field of honor with a smile on my face, yeah? However, we're just getting warmed up, yeah? So uh, we've seen why conditionals are really useful, and we've seen just there with the arguments type why iteration, you know, uh, might be useful. But you can't do a while loop at compile time. Uh, but you can, however, use recursion, yeah? And uh, that's where I hand back to Richard. Yep, so as Garth was saying there, we now have seen that we can create new types from existing types, we can use conditional operators, and because of that, we, although we don't have any sort of procedural loops, uh, we can use our recursion. So yeah, we're gonna use recursion to iterate at compile time. That's lots of scary words put in the same sentence, but let's go and show how that's done. Okay, so to start with, we're gonna just start to, uh, looking at recursive types using numbers. So in this case, what we're gonna use is we've got a type called uh, our ink table, and the properties, you can see, both the properties and the values are literal numbers. So the property is, the value that is pointed to by the property is always an increment of the key, so zero points to one, one to two, and what we can do with that is we can create this uh, type called ink that takes any of those uh, that takes a number any num any type that extends number. Now, once it does that, it checks is that number a key that's inside ink table, i.e., one of the properties from zero to nine. And if it is, it looks up that property and returns the value that's set there. So. Um, what would happen if we, uh, we, if we make an ink of six? Well, that's gonna return seven. And then we can do the same again um, with, uh, uh, when we're going to decrement. So we've got a decrement table this time. The properties point to one less, that, uh, to a value that is one less. So whenever we do a decrement of five, we're gonna return four. So what are we gonna be able to do with these? Well, we're gonna be able to add in types. So how do we do that? We, yeah, it sounds a bit crazy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, a, we're gonna make a type that's uh, called add that takes two numbers. And what you can see there is that it creates an object type uh, with properties again and return. Whenever it hits return, it returns the type A. Um, whenever it hits add, it calls itself again, but with a different value. And that's where a recursion is happening. Now, if you see it just at the bottom line there, we've got, <clears throat> this thing B ex extends zero, we're gonna hit return. So that's our escape clause for the, recurs the recursion loop. And then otherwise we're gonna hit again and call ourselves a recurs recursively. So lots to get in. Let's walk through an example. So say we have, we're gonna add five and three. Well, that's gonna increment five to make six, decrement three to two, increment uh, six to seven, decrement one to zero, and then we're gonna have uh, come back, actually, sorry, the last line's in, by t uh, in error, but we're gonna come back with eight. Uh, so we're, uh, at that stage, when we decrement one, we're gonna, B will be zero, we're gonna have our escape, and hey presto, we have added in types. Lots of fun, lots of acrobatics, not very useful, we'll talk about that in a minute though. Okay, so if anyone's ever worked with single linked lists, uh, in value type, uh, value space or runtime program in, the, in any language, they'll know that a singly linked list is a list that's made up with an element and then a pointer to another list. And so we can actually do the same sort of idea with list types in, in, in the type space. Um, now when we say that, we're not gonna, we, we mean a specific type of list and that's this uh, tuple tape here that we have. So a list where we have a, des a defined set of types. So in this case, we have a sample list, and we can see that it, it will always be a length three. It will always have a boolean as the first value, number as the second, string as the third. And with this, with, if we're, when we're working with these sort of tuple types, we can actually um, recurse over these. So 
to do that, just like in value programming with singly linked lists, we're going to need to get the head and then get the tail or the rest. So we first we define functions to do that. So you can see here, we're taking um, a head of any list, a T that extends a list. And with that, then we say T extends, and it's something similar to what Garth was explaining earlier, a list, and we sort of extract out that uh, T has to have at least uh, one element. So the spread operator uh, on any there could be just an empty list, but that there has to be something there at the head. If it does, then we're going to return the first element, which would be our head element, in the case of sample list, a boolean. Otherwise, we're returning never, which it means it's a type that can never be instantiated. And then on rest, we, again, we're going to take our list. We, we do a spread operator on that list. Uh, we, we put it in as a parameter in a function. This is a, a lot of acrobatics. But if you can see then, what we're doing is we're taking, we have this underscore any, which means we don't care about the tail. Uh, we don't care about the head part. Uh, we, we're grabbing and inferring the tail. And then we're at that, uh, where it's inferred to a type TT, and then we return that. Now, again, we have our conditional there. So we're saying if it doesn't, if it's not, uh, if it's not able to be done, then we're going to return an empty list. Moving on, more. So we're just building this up to see what we can do. So um, what, uh, once we're able to get our head and our tail, the other thing we want to be able to get here is the length of a list. And you can see here, we can actually do that very simply. If you do a, a dot length on, a, on any type, we will get the return type back. So if you do that on our sample list, we will actually get uh, the type 3 back. Whereas if we do it on, say, a standard uh, uh, list where we don't know how many it's in, we'll get a type number back. So, um, but we can actually build this ourselves using recursion. And you can see, again, we're using the same structure. We've got a, an object with property again, a property return. We could call them whatever we want, but it's what we've chosen for this. The return is our escape value where we get our R. And then we have a conditional as well. So we're saying that uh, once, uh, whenever T extends uh, is an empty list, then we're going to return that. So what are we doing? Whenever we hit, uh, if t does have something in it, what we do is we call again. We, we, get the, we get the tail of t, which will be number and string, and then we increment r, which is going to be 1. We go through this continually until, we get our, until we've taken everything out of the list, and we have the kind that gives us our length. OK. Keep, and we're hopefully hanging in there with this. Next, how do we prepend? We can actually prepend to lists, list types. So if we had that, that um, say we wanted to add, create a new type from that sample type in our last slide, say with a, a Boolean on, on it, so say Boolean string number Boolean, we can use this function as well. Again, we're just taking our, uh, the, we're taking the type E, which is the, the type we're going to put on the, at the start of the list, and the list that we're going to prepend it to, to create this. Uh, again, doing a bit of acrobatics, we go and extract with spread operators, uh, E and T, uh, infer a new type U, and then are able to return that. And then from this, what we can do is reverse a list. And this is where we're finishing with these lists. So what we can do is take this sample list, Boolean number and string, reverse it, and come, and come out with a new type of string number and Boolean. Again, using a recursion, working our way through it, we've actually, what we're doing is we have two lists, the one that comes in, uh, this you know, sample list in this case, and then one that's continually built up, that R that's going to be returned. And as we do that, we need to sort of uh, have our escape value where we say once we've actually gone through every element in T. So we're, uh, to do that, we're just incrementing uh, a number here. And so with re incrementing, prepending, re uh, and a bit of a recursion, we are able to actually create something that reverses. And how does that work? Well, if you can see, we've got our sample list here. Whenever we actually call reverse on that, uh, you see the type there is the, uh, on uh, data four is actually a string, a uh, number, and a boolean, which is the reverse of the sample list type. Uh, also, length by recursion is coming out with three. We see that we've got a tail that's able to be assigned as well, and we've got our head as, as well. So that sounds all a bit weird and wonderful, but where would we actually want to use that? Well, actually, it is a very useful uh, tool to have. So if you look at the read-only that we were talking about earlier, the read-only type, 
which is actually a type in the TypeScript library, you may find that you want to make more than just the top level properties read only. Maybe you want to make it deeply nested. Well, you can, uh, if you can use a, a nested uh, recursive deep on, uh, read only type to make everything inside that object um, read only. Also, um, if you want to see a little bit more, we have actually prepared a little demo, a code along that you can go and try where you make um, an HTTP, HTTP GET client that is um, able to catch things like uh, illegal uh, you know, URIs that don't exist uh, and all sorts of stuff where we're using map types, where we're using these recursive types. And it takes you step by step through from just uh, a very simple sort of GET function to something that uh, has a lot more complex types. It's in the code uh, that we're going to put on. Uh, we'll just send a link out later, and you can follow the, the video as well. Back to you, Gars. Thank you very much. So yeah, so uh, as Richard was saying, that's a really good demo for bringing everything together, and uh, it's available online right now. So in your copious free time, love that phrase, uh, it's, uh, it's well worth having a wee look at. So just to draw some conclusions and finish off, we've been coding in type space. So I'm sure everybody you know, viewing this uh, presentation will be an expert in coding in value space. It's the same concepts, but we've just taken it to, uh, to type space instead. And uh, we very deliberately called this presentation, you know, type-driven development, because the, the new TDD, because there's a really nice metaphor there with test-driven development. Because in test-driven development, well, at the beginning, people said you had tests. You know, when tests are a binary thing, they say you're right or wrong. You know, they, they determine whether or not you can go on, and that's it. So you can think about the compiler the same way. You know, uh, with Java or C, you declare your types, and then the compiler either says you're right or you're wrong, and that's it. Yeah. But then TDD was really the realization that the tests could guide your implementation. You know, the tests were there to be your friend. So uh, the tests couldn't do everything for you, but they could help lead you incrementally, step by step, towards a correct implementation. So whenever you're doing type level programming, you know, whenever you're programming in type space, it's the same idea. You know, we can come up with these types, and these types can incrementally lead us uh, towards a correct implementation. So uh, we can, if you create what the Haskell folks call like type holes, you know, we can say, I'm not sure about that, yeah, and then we can let the uh, the compiler guide us towards a, uh, a correct solution. So it's a very, very powerful approach. So uh, there's a URL there to a Bitbucket repository, uh, which contains all the examples that you've seen uh, in this slide deck, and uh, there's the link to the, the coding demo there that Richard did. So uh, that's our show. So. Uh